lots of scaffolding being brought in, loads and loads of these low loaders with huge big pipes on them. And then I started to think, hang on, what's happening here? But Brenda didn't have to wait long to find out exactly what was going on. It soon became apparent that the company was building wind farms. I felt absolutely devastated, absolutely devastated. Frightened, you know, worried, panic-stricken, thinking this is going to be my life forever. And over the next few months, Brenda could only watch as the once peaceful, idyllic atmosphere behind her home disappeared. All I can see when I come out of my house is huge metal structures. I get so upset looking at them because they're so big. Understandably. Now, the site these foundations are destined for will sit off the northeast coast of Scotland and will eventually become the largest wind farm in the UK, providing electricity for up to 450,000 homes. And whilst that's undoubtedly good news for the environment, for Brenda, all she can see and indeed hear, is years more disruption as the building work continues. She's recorded some of it on her mobile phone. Can't go outside in the morning and have a cup of coffee for the excessive noise. It's five past 12. How are you possibly supposed to get to sleep? There's a lot of sort of like heavy wagons, and lorries and things. You hear them shouting, you hear the noise and the noise through the night. I can't open my windows. There's just a constant noise throughout the day. What's it being next to Newcastle Airport? Brenda is devastated, not just because she's lost the peace and quiet she so wanted, but also because she fears it will now become much more difficult to sell her property. Oh, hiya, you okay. right? yeah. And that's a worry shared by some of her neighbours. You kind of hang your washing out, you kind of go in the garden, open your curtains in the morning, it's just like, whoa, it just hits you. I mean, we've had to move bedrooms because of the noise. Sleeping, you don't get a full night. Yeah. So what are you thinking about doing? Are you thinking about selling? Well, I would like to if I can afford it. And I know that sort of a few other neighbours who I've spoken to as well, they're on about selling or they're thinking about selling. They're going to lose money and I can't afford People to People who money. are mortgage are going to have negative equity. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to move. I got this house because I thought this was going to be me sort of long term. But I've been home. so unhappy, Irene. I, I think I'm at the stage where I would like to move. I, and I never thought it because I was happy for a while. Yeah. But, I mean, but why, should what's we? My why should we move? I know. Unfortunately for Brenda, what she hadn't realised at the time she'd bought her house was that the land next to it, while largely vacant back then, was already designated for industrial use. And as it had been used as a shipyard for generations, it would be relatively straightforward for similar activity to start up on the site, regardless of any objections that the local residents like Brenda might have. And when we asked solicitor Gary Rycroft about it at our pop-up shop, he says there's actually very little she could do to challenge that. Local and national governments have development plans in place for the type of land use that they want certain areas of land to be used for. So Brenda has no obvious means of claiming compensation from any local or government entity here. Well, the construction company currently operating on the site told us it's been working very closely with the local council to minimize any disruption for residents and has done all it can to limit any nuisance. Stressing it took over the site after the loudest work had been done, it says it spent a significant amount of money in noise reduction elements and noise from the site is now in accordance with the accepted criteria. As for the look of the site, the company suggested it's now something of a regional landmark, but various measures have been put in place to mitigate the visual effect. It told us it's received positive feedback from many of its neighbours and it reiterated that the land has been used for industrial purposes for over 200 years. So whilst the houses are new, this type of activity on the site is not. But this is a tricky issue, because while it's easy to understand the benefits of switching to cleaner, greener sources of energy, having the infrastructure right on your doorstep is unlikely to be so appealing. And the residents here in Necton, Norfolk, fear that the drive for renewable energy could ruin their once tranquil village. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you ever so much for all coming. Ambitious plans for a new offshore wind farm off the coast of Norfolk could provide electricity for 1.3 million homes. But the plans would see a huge cable corridor dug right across the county, affecting around 2,500 acres of land that includes many homes and farms. And what's more, 
two new electrical substations covering 70 acres would be built next to the village of Necton. And these residents are very concerned about the potential impact. Well, it's a disaster for us. You know, we're a small farm, finding it difficult to find a way to survive. The only way we thought we was going to was to diversify into a form of glamping. But now with this on the horizon, construction work with massive noise and upset, I mean, it's all on hold, you know? I mean, what do we do? With pensions going the way they are, mm. I was kind of relying on my house to see some return on exactly. it. Though. We've had to put up with a lot of noise, and especially lighting. It's been on day and night, and it's been a real intrusion into our personal life. Necton residents Jenny and Tony Smedley are acutely aware of what the proposed development could involve. They already have one electrical substation close to their home, so the new plans would mean that there would be a second. And what frustrates them the most is that they had no idea any substation was going to be built when they bought their property back in 2014. Come on, girls. Are you hungry? We found this place, and it was absolutely perfect. The back garden was completely open. There was no fences, no hedges. Yeah, good girls. It was like being on holiday. It was like paradise. But I'm afraid Jenny and Tony's holiday feeling didn't last long. A few months after moving in, they learned that an electrical substation was to be built nearby. That he discovered that a substation was going to be built behind us. First of all, you think, oh, well, substations are just little red boxes, aren't they? Little brick boxes. So we thought, maybe it's not too bad. And he said, no, it isn't. It's going to be 16 acres. The first substation was built 800 metres away from their property, which is the length of around seven football pitches. But even at that distance, they say it creates quite a racket. When they started to erect it, we realised just how awful it was going to be. And then, you know, the noise started. And it's a strange thing, noise, how it carries. I mean, we're about 800 metres from it, but it really sounded like dinosaurs in the back garden. Jenny and Tony fear this substation will make it hard to sell their property in the future. And given that the planning permission was in place when they bought it, they can't understand why they weren't informed prior to the purchase. But as Gary Rycroft explains, this type of development may not appear on the standard searches that are made when buying a property. So asking your solicitor to carry out some extra checks could prevent you from facing a similar situation. You can carry out a local search against the property that you're buying, which will reveal information known to the local authority about that particular property. It's also sensible to instigate a search against any neighbouring properties or neighbouring pieces of land which are of importance to you and which you are concerned may be developed in the future. However, a search is only as good as the date it's carried out on. So just because land has a particular designated use in one particular year doesn't mean that that use won't change as the years move on. In 2015, Jenny and Tony took their case to the property ombudsman, arguing that the estate agent who sold them the property should have made them aware of the plans prior to purchase. The ombudsman agreed and ordered that they were paid £1,000 in view of the aggravation, distress and inconvenience caused. Well, they thought that was the end of that until they heard last year of the proposal to add two substations to the area. These leaflets came through the door and Tony picked it up and read it and he didn't say a word, he just handed it to me. And I looked up and I said to him, it's another one. And although Tony, Jenny and the village's other residents appreciate that the substation will eventually provide electricity to over a million homes, they're concerned their voices won't be heard in the final decision-making process. And the explanation for that lies in legislation stating that developments classed as nationally significant infrastructure projects, such as train lines, airports, or in this case, wind farms, can be given accelerated planning permission by the government, taking the final decision out of the hands of the local authority. We realise this process is like a steamroller. It's a project of national importance. It doesn't follow all the, lows, the usual rules. It can put in for planning consent without detailed design. So you don't know what you're getting. They're just going to come here. They're just going to steamroll it all the way. And there's nothing we can do about it. 
Well, we put that to the company Vattenfall, hoping to build the new substation. It says its natural residents will have concerns about such a significant proposal, but stressed it has listened to those since the plans were first proposed in 2016. For example, by moving the substation away from the village, as well as planning state-of-the-art acoustic insulation to reduce any noise impacts to an acceptable level. It then went on to say that the proposed design also minimizes impact with most components housed out of sight within a building and that it offers significant opportunities to the community to benefit. We also spoke to Statoil, the company that built and operates the current substation in Necton. It said the site passes the strict criteria for noise monitoring and that landscaping and tree plantations have been put in place to minimize the visual impact, which it expects to be more effective as the trees grow over the years. A decision on the plans for Necton is expected in 2019. But back in Tyneside, Brenda still just can't believe that something she's had no say over could so dramatically affect her home and her happiness. It's trapped us here. It's given us an inability to be able to sell it and move if I want. And that's it. They've took the choice away from us. I feel like I'm stuck here. Now, of all the stories we've investigated over the years, this next one remains one of the most shocking. Not only did the family concerned lose their home in the most extraordinary way, but unravelling the whole sorry saga has now left them facing the prospect of being hundreds of thousands of pounds in debt. And the entire mess is down to one builder who, despite leaving the homeowners literally without a roof over their heads, has been able to walk away from the situation relatively scot-free. I first met Jackie two years ago when she told me the devastating story of how one builder had caused her dream home to turn into a nightmare, which I'm sorry to say only seems to be getting worse. It all began after Jackie and her husband, Ed, bought the lease to their North London flat in 2011. They'd hoped a basement conversion would give them the extra space they'd need when they had their first child. We found this place and it seemed ideal. It had potential for development to make it into a family home. It was actually right next door to a family friend. It sort of made up our minds. For such a big job, they knew they needed a competent builder. So they went to the Federation of Master Builders website to find someone who they believed would have the right skills. This seemed like a very tricky job. That's why I went through what I thought were all the checks we could possibly do to find the right one. Jackie eventually agreed a price with a builder, Christopher Knott, and his company Ames Plumbing and Building Services, not to be confused with other companies with similar names. And having found him through the Federation of Master Builders, she was not only reassured about his expertise, but also by the fact that he'd agreed to take out extra insurance to cover costs should anything go wrong with the build. But despite her diligence, Jackie had plumped for the wrong man. She woke up one morning to see a crack appearing in the wall. It was wide enough to see through to the outside. And we called the builder. He came and had a look. He seemed a little bit worried, but still didn't give us any indication that it was very serious. In fact, it was so serious that within hours, the whole house, including the flat above them, began to collapse. It was like being in a disaster movie when there's an earthquake or something happening and the house just disintegrates. Jackie, who was eight months pregnant, and her husband, Ed, were hurriedly taken outside by the fire brigade. And all they could do was to look on helplessly as their home slowly fell into the ground. I just think we were in shock, all of us, just watching it unfold. We all just to literally would stand on the street and watch, watch it sort of disintegrate. Where was the builder? We called him and he came, had a look, saw the emergency services and just ran off again. He ran off? Yeah, he just disappeared. In a matter of minutes, the actions of one builder had left the family with nothing. We lost everything. It was just taken away in skips as we were watching, and there was no way to retrieve it. We weren't allowed back in. 
the couple took the builder to court, where a judge ruled that he was responsible for the collapse of the house and ordered him to pay nearly £290,000 for the damage he had caused. But Jackie and Ed never got a penny from him. Because he traded as a limited company, he had no personal liability and was able to simply dissolve his company. We knew that that meant he was off the hook. To add insult to injury, within weeks, Christopher Knott was able to set up a new company and continue trading as normal, while the family was still picking through the rubble he'd left behind. The next stage of the saga then began, and with the builder seemingly long gone, the couple set about the whole rigmarole of trying to recoup some of the costs owed to them. Jackie and Ed knew that with the builder's business now wound up, they wouldn't easily be able to get hold of the money the judge had ordered it to pay in order for them to rebuild their home. So they took on solicitors to try and get Christopher Knott's insurance company to cough up instead. That too proved far from straightforward. And Jackie says it was only the couple's own efforts with the insurer that led to progress being made. It's two years since we last saw each other. Tell me what's been going on since then. Finally, we managed to negotiate with the insurers who initially didn't want to have anything to do with this. Um, so that was a, a real high point in, uh, in the last few years. But the couple's hopes that they could at long last start rebuilding their lives were short-lived. There's been disagreement over what payment is due to the solicitors. Though Jackie firmly believes they'd been assured there'd be no fee without an agreement that covered all damages and costs, the solicitor has sent a bill that it's confident reflects the value of the work it completed on the couple's behalf, and it comes to a total of half a million pounds. With no way of finding that kind of money, Jackie and Ed have taken the dispute to the legal ombudsman. But while they await a decision, yet another complication has now arisen. Jackie has heard that the freeholder of the land where her house used to sit has argued that because of the delay in rebuilding their home, they should give up their lease to him entirely. So all told, they still feel in a desperate situation. It must yeah. be very hard to actually sort of focus on life, you know, with your young children and enjoying that aspect when you've got this hanging over you. It's, yeah, I do feel there's this enormous stress hanging over us does impact our family life. Um, and obviously we just we try and enjoy life as much as we can with the kids, but it just should all be so different. I know this is a terribly harsh question to ask after such a, a horrible story, but if you look back on it, is there something that you should have done? The judge in the trial said that we had done everything that we could have done. It was very unfortunate that the builder had let us down so badly. Very unfortunate situation with the solicitors now. But while Jackie and her family are facing the prospect of losing what little they have left, Christopher Knott, the builder responsible for this whole mess, is still out there plying his trade. How did you feel about that? Pretty devastated. I and mean, Our lives had been turned upside down. For him to get away scot-free was just... Devastating. And it's clear Jackie isn't the only homeowner whose life this builder has turned upside down. I was contacted out of the blue one day by a lady who had seen our story. She explained to me that she had hired this builder, which had gone disastrously wrong, and they had to file a claim against him. And I ended up in January 2018, going to court with them and being a witness in their case. And they ended up winning their case against him. But again, it means nothing because he's shut the company down and there won't be any money to pay them. Same old story. Same old story. Since causing Jackie's house to collapse, Jackie says that she has discovered numerous other companies set up by Christopher Knott and has been contacted by more people he's let down. Now, when we first featured Jackie's case in 2016, we spoke to the Federation of Master Builders about Christopher Knott's company, Ames Plumbing and Building Services, having been a member. After all, membership of this trade body is widely seen as a seal of approval, a handy way that anyone like Jackie can go online and search for a builder that's both capable and trustworthy. When this came to light, we suspended the company immediately and then we asked the company to come before a National Standards and Conduct Committee. 
they reviewed the case and they agreed that actually the member companies should be expelled. And that company will never come back into the uh, FMB again. But despite these reassurances, Christopher Knott did manage to find his way back onto the FMB website. When we checked, his latest company, London Elite Trades, again, not to be confused with companies with similar names, was listed as a member on the Federation of Master Builders website, which could mean that other people, just like Jackie, end up hiring Christopher Knott in the belief that he's the right builder for their project. Well, we immediately contacted the Federation of Master Builders to tell them what we'd found. And it said as soon as it was made aware the company was run by Christopher Knott, it took immediate action to expel London Elite Trades Limited from membership. The FMB told us the company's admission had only arisen because Mr Knott had supplied false information by not declaring his previous membership. It went on to say it takes its responsibility for promoting high standards very seriously, so it'll be reviewing its application processes to ensure the highest standards are met. We also tried to contact Christopher Knott himself, but despite emails, letters and phone calls, we've heard nothing back. And whilst Jackie continues to try and put her life back together, she's extremely keen to warn others against employing the services of Christopher Knott or any of the companies he may go on to set up. So if the builder was in here with you and you were able to tell him what you think, what would you say? I would say what he already knows, which is he could have killed us. But it doesn't stop there. He's gone on to ruin other people's lives as well. When will this end? He just keeps setting up new companies and carrying on. Still to come on Rip Off Britain, how to avoid unexpected costs that couldn't come at a worse time. I felt like somebody just punched me in the stomach. It was just like a living hell. Our pop-up shop at Manchester's Trafford Centre has opened its doors again, offering advice on a whole host of consumer problems. I can tell you that after years of doing our pop-up shop, it never fails to surprise us that so many of you come flooding in with tales of being shortchanged and ripped off. And you know what? We're more than happy to listen and hopefully be able to help. Eunice Nelson from Liverpool came in at the end of her tether after the brand new all-in-one buggy, pram and push chair for which she paid £350 turned out to have a serious flaw. Hello. Hello, Sonia. Eunice. Thanks for coming to see me. Take a seat. She's hoping that trading standards expert Sylvia Rook can help. I bought a travel system away in August and whenever I, I packed, I tried to lock the gate, the brakes, it just wouldn't lock. So I did phone up this company whom I ordered the three-in-one travel system for. And they emailed me with a list of things to do. Spray WD-40, uh, take the wheels off, see if there's any debris, give it a wipe. And then I did all that and still brakes wouldn't lock. My baby is now five months old. Right, and you, you're still using it? I'm still using it, but then I have to be really careful. If I park in a place where is windy or is slopey, I have the that, chances that, more. That is really quite serious, isn't it? Because obviously you're talking a very precious commodity to your child. The last thing you want is a, a, a yeah. buggy where the, the, where the brakes don't work. So mm. what you're wanting, you want one that works. What have they said to you in terms of sending it back and getting a replacement? If I send it back, they are going to review it, have a look at it to see what they want to do, whether the damage is mechanical or whatever it is. And I did ask, how long is this going to take? because I need one ASAP to use with my baby. For Eunice, being without the buggy for any length of time was a non-starter, but Sylvia says she shouldn't have to be. What the law says is that whatever they offer you, it shouldn't cause you significant inconvenience. This is something obviously really serious because you can't, you can't cope without a pusher. So what you could say to them is that if they're not going to give you a loan push chair in the interim, you will hire one. But if they agree that the item is faulty, you'll expect them to pay the cost because you shouldn't be at any loss. How did you pay for it? 
I paid it on my credit card. Credit card. Because that's another option. If, if you're not getting any joy from the company, yes. then you can always talk to your credit card company because they, they are equally liable. So any, any rights you have against the retailer, you've got the same rights against the credit card company. And they might be able to pay for the cost of the hire of the, the buggy in the interim period. So it's certainly worth talking to them as well. Well, after that, Eunice did write a letter to the retailer, as Sylvia suggested, and it replied saying, as a gesture of goodwill, it would replace the whole chassis at no extra cost. So we're pleased to say the buggy is now 100% fixed, which is exactly what the people over in our gripe corner would like to see happen, with the many and varied issues driving them up the wall. Every time I'm from my bank statement, my TV media package is always going up. One month it's 50, then it's 60. When's it going to stop? I'm sick and tired from people trying to ring me up, especially at night I'm over a meeting. Just tell me, have you had an accident? I go to one major supermarket and I pay a pound dollar. Go to another major supermarket and it's one pound fifty-eight. The same law, the same brand, the same colour. Crazy. Let's now turn to a subject that I bet probably is not on your to-do list today, and that's your will. Now, it's the piece of paper that really no one likes to discuss until they really have to, but uh, like it or not, without one, tricky issues like money, property, and even who looks after your children are far harder to sort out. Just because you've actually put your last request down on paper, doesn't mean that your wishes will necessarily be carried out exactly as you had planned. In fact, who you choose to execute your will can be just as important as making one in the first place. So listen up, because this is advice you simply cannot afford to miss. The benefits of making a will so your nearest and dearest are clear on your wishes is something that we've highlighted before. But as Wendy Burgess from Oldham, Greater Manchester can testify, who you appoint to execute those wishes can have just as big an impact on the loved ones left behind. My mum was a very independent person. She paid for her own house. She, she did everything herself. So I just trusted my mum knew what she was doing and I never questioned it or looked into it. In 2012, Wendy's mother, Jean, was diagnosed with terminal cancer and set about getting her affairs in order. Eight years earlier, she'd made her will, appointing Wendy and a solicitor as joint executors. I never really discussed it with her because I didn't want to. So I just assumed it would be a straightforward process that if anything happened, everything gets dealt with. Jean died in 2015, and as Wendy started to come to terms with her loss, her thoughts turned to her mum's will. Jean had left a house worth £130,000 plus £30,000 in savings to be distributed amongst her grandchildren once any outstanding mortgage and funeral costs had been taken care of. This included £2,500 to cover the legal fees that she believed would pay for her solicitor to administer her estate. And indeed, when Wendy and the solicitor met for the first time, it seemed that would be enough to cover these costs. They gave me an estimate of which at that point were £1,200 to £2,000. My mum had left £2,500 to pay for the solicitor's fees. So at that point, it just all seemed very straightforward. But things weren't as straightforward as Wendy had hoped. Due to unforeseen complications and delays, the solicitor's costs started to creep up, which Wendy just hadn't expected. I began to feel like we were being taken advantage of. He was just running away with my mum's money and there was nothing we could do to stop him. Well, in fact, as the solicitor's itemised breakdowns show, Wendy was only being charged for the work that was being done. And when she complained about a number of issues to the legal ombudsman, it agreed with the solicitors that the charges up to that point weren't unreasonable and had been made clear. The ombudsman also found that the firm's overall level of service was reasonable too. But it didn't seem that way to Wendy, and as sorting everything out continued to rumble on and as a result the solicitor's cost kept on rising, she became increasingly concerned as to how much of her mother's estate would end up in legal fees. I just felt devastated. I hadn't even started to grieve for my mum. I just wanted to be left in peace. And I just felt we were being absolutely tormented. 
like it was a game. Well, the root of all this comes from the way the solicitor was engaged in the first place. They were operating on what's known as a time spent agreement and on an hourly rate, so the costs weren't fixed. And while that would most likely have been fine if the will had been as simple as anticipated, because there were complications that needed resolving, it now appeared that Wendy could be facing a total legal bill of up to £10,000, four times what she'd been expecting. In desperation, she approached the solicitor to ask him to stop acting on her behalf. At this point, I just couldn't deal with it anymore. I was pregnant at the time. The stress was horrific. I had to ask him at that point to stop um, because I was frightened of the debt that he was running up. But because the solicitor had been formally appointed as executor by her late mum, there was little Wendy could do about it. And now, three years after Jean died, with some key matters still not yet sorted, the whole business is dragging on. And according to Wendy, the final figure for legal costs remains unclear. I felt like somebody had just punched me in the stomach. It was just like a living hell, like an absolute living hell. And it's, it's still ongoing. Well, when we contacted the firm of solicitors in this case, it emphasised that its fees are entirely proportionate to the volume of work undertaken. It disputed elements of Wendy's version of events, suggesting they underestimate the complications involved in the administration of her late mother's affairs. And while it accepts that the costs are higher than the original estimate, it made clear it's keeping Wendy informed at every stage. It went on to say it's disappointed that she feels all of this has extended her period of grieving and highlights various reasons why the case is ongoing. But our legal expert, Gary Rycroft, says that cases like Wendy's are all too common and that while appointing a solicitor as executor of your will can have advantages, particularly where there may be a family dispute, it's not essential and it's key that the costs are fully considered early on. It's important for you to understand whether there might be circumstances where the initial fee quoted may have to change because circumstances change. Sometimes during the administration of an estate, things arise that weren't expected at the outset. Assets pop up that weren't known about at the beginning. Gary also suggests that putting arrangements discussed around costs in writing can make a huge difference when it comes to sorting out things further down the line. Solicitors will offer a variety of ways to charge for their services. Some of them will want to charge according to an hourly rate, and that may be because they're not sure of just how complex or how long the administration of the estate will take. Some solicitors will want to charge according to a percentage of the estate, perhaps one or two percent. Now, in order for a solicitor to provide you with a fixed fee, they will need to have as much information as possible from you about the extent of the estate and the complexity of this, the estate so that the solicitor can work out how much time he or she thinks it's going to take them to do the work, and then they can provide you with a transparent fixed fee. All advice with which Anthea Rogers from Wiltshire would wholeheartedly agree after she too was surprised at the mounting legal costs after the sudden death of her mother in October 2014. My mother had a long-term medical issue, which meant that she had difficulty in coping with day-to-day -day life. And when my father died in 2010, I think she found it very difficult to cope. And um, so she died quite suddenly and unexpectedly. Before she died, Anthea's mum had appointed a law firm as executor of her estate, worth around £400,000. I wanted things conducted quite quickly and professionally. Um, my mother had chosen this firm of solicitors. I thought that things were going to move quite quickly. But again, the process proved far from straightforward. And two years after her mum died, Anthea was still trying to sort out her estate. And throughout that time, legal fees had risen to what was eventually just under £11,000, which Anthea says she was surprised by not least because she'd expressed concerns about the level of service she'd received throughout the whole process. I think when you've been bereaved, it's important to, to move on from those feelings and that, that process after the funeral and everything. And, and I wasn't able to do that. And I think that for me, you know, from a sort of mental health perspective was 
was one of the toughest things, just to feel powerless. Anthea took her complaint about the level of service she'd received and the costs to the legal ombudsman. And whilst it agreed with some aspects of her complaint and awarded her £500 in costs, a sum Anthea rejected as unsatisfactory, the ombudsman didn't agree with Anthea that the fees charged were unreasonable, but were in fact in line with the work that the firm had carried out. But after further separate negotiations between Anthea and her solicitor, she received a further £5,000 compensation. But for Anthea, she believes the whole experience has not worked out as her mum would have wanted. Because my mum was a stickler for detail, she wouldn't have understood why it took so long. And I think she would have been quite angry that it took over two years to sort things out. Like she would have been very disappointed in that. Well, the law firm that handled Anthea's mum's estate told us that it always makes sure that its charges are reasonable. It says that at the beginning, it made clear it did not know the complexity of the estate. And when the administration was complicated by developments it could not have anticipated, it says it updated Anthea and her family straight away. It says that.